Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 279, recorded Monday, December 26th, 2016. The best of the year. Triangulation is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high-quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash Hello, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful holiday, Christmas, Hanukkah. What is it, Saturnalia that you uh, you pagans celebrate? If <laughs> Here we are the day after. Normally, of course, we'd be doing triangulation right now, but I sent everybody home for the week, and instead we're going to give you some of the best moments from triangulation all year long. Triangulation is our interview show. We are going to start with, you know, it's so funny, the, the list of people on this show is amazing. Bill Atkinson, James Gosling, Richard Marks, PlayStation VR, Kevin Kelly with his new book, Case Links, how he developed Wi-Fi, the inventor of Wi-Fi, the creator of Gopher and Pop Mail, Edward Snowden's lawyer. Didn't get Edward Snowden this year, maybe next year. Anyway, we'll kick things off with the inventor of the wiki and a programming hero, Ward Cunningham. I don't even know where to begin. I've, we've talked before. I think we talked on Floss Weekly, Ward, many years ago. Yeah. But uh, you're a legend in computing for so many uh, reasons. Uh, inventor of the wiki, which I personally, which, you know, makes me happy because uh, I love wikis. Uh, but also uh, early part of the small talk community, uh, instrumental right. in creating programming patterns, which if you're a programmer, the word patterns will, you know, ring a bell for you. You worked at Microsoft uh, in their pattern and practices group for a while. Uh, was it Eclipse? Of course, if you're a programmer, you know the Eclipse editor and IDE. Um, and now he's at New Relic. And if you want to know anything about the Internet, and we were just talking before the show, we, we run on New Relic. All of our uh, web stats come from uh, New Relic. So he is, he's got his fingers in anything, many of the things you use every day. Ward, welcome. It's great to have you on Triangulation. Well, it's great to be here. I appreciate it. You're up in Portland uh, at the New Relic headquarters. That's right. Very nice. So, uh, gosh, I almost, I want to start with Wiki, but really I know that was not, that's kind of in the middle of your uh, career, but I just... There's something about wikis. It, it seems to me that wikis really lived up to the r original promise of Tim Berners-Lee's World Wide Web. When he created the web, he envisioned it as a system of documents that his colleagues could use, edit, edit with hyperlinks, could jump around, could read footnotes, come back. A, a very fluid kind of documenting system. And that's really what wiki became. Is that Was that the inspiration for a wiki? You know, I learned that uh, after I built it. No, I, I actually started experimenting with HyperCard. I love I was HyperCard. In a research lab, and uh, this thing ended up on my desk, and I could tell it wasn't a relational database, and I was trying to figure out what kind of database is it. And, and I'd had an interest in, uh, you know, kind of the absorption of technology among technologists, and, and so I built a little database out of cards, that kind of tracked how ideas move through my company. Uh, that was Tektronix at the time, and, and of course Tektronix uh, built the instruments that built the computers that uh, we love today. So, uh, you know, I actually haven't changed much from Tektronix, which uh, measured hardware, to, uh, you know, New Relic that measures software. You know? but, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I found at the time that uh, engineers were awfully conservative. They didn't want to use something if they haven't seen it work before. And so I just asked people, you know, what ideas did you bring to your last project and where did you get them? Where did you see them work before? And, and it made an interesting hypertext. And so when we started looking for patterns, you know, I, was, I said, well, gee, I wish I had a network version of HyperCard, uh, and I didn't. But then uh, hypertext came along. 
you know, the right. uh, the web, and we said, well, let's see if I can make something that feels like Hypercar, but runs on the web. And, and I was interested not in Hypercard in the graphical sense, but but I I ginned up a version of Hypercard where you could write about cards that didn't yet exist, you know, so that you could build this. I mean, when I ask people, what's where did you learn? Where did the company learn everything that it ever learned? Was really the question I was trying to answer. You, you know, it had to be useful and complete. You know, there had to be links that didn't go anywhere, and and uh, that was, you know, something that the hypertext researchers of the time thought was a failure. Every uh, link had to lead somewhere. Oh, absolutely! You didn't yeah. want to get stuck. Well, I just changed it so. You know, if you click on a link and it wasn't there, it'd do a little beep. But if you just pressed and held the button longer, it just created it. So you felt like you were pushing a page into the, uh, into the, uh, into the stack. No one was more surprised than I was when Bill Atkinson, one of the kind of foundational guys for the original Macintosh, he wrote the lowest level quick draw routines that made really made the Mac possible, the graphical display possible anyway sent me an email and said, hey, I, uh, I'd like to get on uh, triangulation. Okay, Bill. <laughs> it turned out to be a marathon interview. We did ended up chopping up into two shows, and then he came back for another round, and I think he'll be back again in 2017. He's one of my absolute heroes. Here's Bill Atkinson talking about the invention of the Mac. You know, 40 years since the founding of Apple Computer. And yep. That's kind of nice to celebrate that birthday with somebody who helped make such a difference in our lives. I brought out my Inside Macintosh ah, volumes. This, Carolyn Rose. Yeah, She's boy, my did, hero. she documented it all. And anybody who wanted to write software for the Macintosh needed this. But this is, nowadays, you know, if you, if you, you can get the Windows documentation, a full API documentation. It's similar to this. But at the mm -hmm. time... Nobody had done this before. Yeah. The ROM itself was brilliant. The idea that you build a computer that has all the primitives built into it, into the hardware, to do Windows and all these things that you're doing, it blew my mind. The way you get software to be interoperable and compatible user interface is to provide tools in the ROM so that it's easier for a developer to use those tools. They can write their own one-off. She doesn't have to write her own. If, yeah. But if you use these, um, it, you won't have to write them, and you'll look more like the other apps, and so it'll be easier for somebody who's already learned how to yes. use one app to, to use another app. It was a, it was a wonderful, virtuous uh, circle because, of course, you had the user interface guidelines. What do you got Can there? I bring out He's this? He's got something. Yeah, okay, bring this, this out. Is, Look at this. This is uh, December 1983. Oh, man. Here, hold it up a little higher there. Actually, yeah, you know what I'll... You manage the reflection. Yeah, there you here. go. Yeah. <laughs> that is you, this of is, course. Uh, me. I had a little more hair back then. This is 33 years ago. Wow. And that's Steve. And I look at his eyes. He's kind of got this little calculating look like, how can I harness this kid's <laughs> energy? <laughs> this is two months before the release of the Macintosh. Yeah, it came out in January, January 24, 1984. 1984. I got mine in March. I was a 100-day buyer. I went to Macy's with my credit card. I had wanted a Lisa so badly, and I couldn't afford that. But yeah. 2500 bucks. I thought, maybe I can get that. It was the first three. We all wanted it to be 1500 I know. We I know, were it was really a great disappointed. To get the last yeah. minute, it got jacked up to 2400 uh, And it didn't change the world right away, I think, no. because of that price Apple point. Apple almost died. Yeah. It was a little slow. But people, got, you know, I got it. The minute I turned one on and booted it up, the minute you saw Steve turn it on and it said, hello, it was, wow. And that, by the way, that hello, that first hello written in the program you wrote, Mac Paint. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this, this computer had... 128 k bytes of semiconductor memory. Wow. And this one has 128 gigabytes <laughs> of semiconductor memory. <laughs> a factor of a million. A million more. A million more memory. <laughs> and it isn't really that much bigger. <laughs> uh, Somebody made for me, or made, I love and this. I got this. I love this. When the iPad came out, yeah. they made a Patentosh. See, it's a cover for <laughs> There's uh, the, the back of, a, of an iPad. There's it here. I'll show it over, I'll show it over here. Isn't that funny? You, read, you wear that on your... And by the way, I love it that you use an iPad that you... Oh, yeah. You know, I think Jeff would have... What do you think Jeff would have thought of the, uh, of the iPad? Because he wanted to make... I remember he had... His vision was, you know, uh, what, what did he call it? I can't remember. Uh, the Cannon Cat was an information appliance. An information appliance. Yeah. Uh, he had a great heart. And some of the ways that he 
was short-sighted was that he didn't think in terms of a platform. Yeah. And this is why Steve took the project away from him. Right. Jeff was the father of the Macintosh project. Steve was actually the father of the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. And the, he, he had to take it away because he wanted to make it an open platform people could write for. The apps are what make the Mac have, worth having. And what uh, Jeff thought was, well, it's like an appliance. You, you buy a toaster and it has right. a certain set of features and it, you don't ever That's expect it. it to do anything more. Um, Jeff wanted the Mac to have a 256 by 256 pixel display. It was cute because you could address it with a 16-bit number, <laughs> any one pixel. That was kind of short-sighted, but <laughs> he, he didn't want to use the 68,000 processor. He did want a bitmap display. I mean, that was, yeah. a, that was important. Oh, no, he was Just very early in pushing toward a bitmap display. Yeah. But um, he didn't want it to use the 68,000 processor. Really? What did he want to use? 6809, a little teeny 8 bit huh. processor that, um, you know, would have been cheaper, yeah. but wouldn't have been able to use any of the stuff that I'd written for the Lisa. So, Quick Draw, because we were using a 68000, was pretty much a direct port. Um, I gave the sources to Andy Hertzfeld, and he did a few tweaks to them, but basically. That's cool. Uh, it in went in the wrong. I think I owned. I think my code owned two th owned more or more than one third of the entire ROM. Wow, but that was more than QuickDraw. Was that just QuickDraw? Quick a third of the ROM was QuickDraw. Yeah. What was QuickDraw? Tell us about QuickDraw. QuickDraw was the graphic primitives that Elisa and a Mac used. When you um, draw some text, who turns the pixels on and off? When you draw uh, lines or shaded areas with a texture pattern. Right. Who turns the pixels on and off? As you a didn't programmer, want the you applications just to, to have to do that. Right. It would be really, really slow. As a programmer, you just want to say, draw a circle here, yeah. shade it 50% uh, gray. You don't want to think about how that's getting, uh, getting right. done. Right, and it needs to be done very fast. That's the so key, isn't it? I wrote software. I, it had to be done pretty much all in assembly language, mm -hmm. and even with unrolled loops, where I'd had you know a wow. part of the code, it would know we've got we to do 17 uh, long words across, it would jump into a table 17 from the end of the table. So it would do it there without any decrement and branch instructions to eat up. Because that had slowed down. The computer was only, uh, um, I think Lisa was only five megahertz processor cl uh, clock and the yeah. Mac was eight megahertz. Right. And so what you could do in a microsecond wasn't that much. So what I wanted it to be is such that you could use um, software driving of all of the interface and do it performant enough that real applications could use it. Previously had been done in hardware, right? I yeah. mean, that was what, what, that was what in Apple did, What happened right? is you put one byte in a location and a character generator ROM would read out the five by seven dot pattern right. as the, the computer, as the display was scanning. Mm. And that was very efficient, very fast, but it meant you could only do the characters that were in that ROM. Right. You couldn't do graphics. Right. Uh, there were a number of decisions that went in that were um, really based on Jeff's insistence on doing uh, an all graphical interface. The first was a white background with black text. Now, before like a this, piece of paper. our computers had black backgrounds yeah. and either green white or, or green yeah. or amber. <laughs> yeah. And my argument, and the hardware guys on the Lisa team really did not want that no kidding. because it would flicker more right it would uh wear out the phosphor faster right. it required um it required a faster phosphor so that it wouldn't smear as you scrolled um and my argument was if you're going to do graphics i mean i can see inverting text going from white on black to black on white when mm -hmm. you go to print you're never going to print on black paper you're going to print mm -hmm. on white paper mm -hmm. if you want to have graphics you're not going to want to invert them because you're how do you know whether to invert this part and not that part? You need to have a white. You need to have a white right. background on the display so that when you print it onto white paper, it worked. Right. And it was kind of a big fight over that, and and uh, Jobs sided with me on that. He's, now, he, were you? He with, took my argument. Were you with Steve when he went to Xerox and saw the the, the yep. what they were doing? Yeah. So how important was that? I mean, were you already thinking along those lines? Yep. Yes, we were. We had already. Uh, we already had software working in the lab that used a white background, that used okay. a mouse that we had gotten. You know, I used my first mouse in 1971 down at the University of California in San Diego in Kent Wilson's chemistry lab. Wow. And uh, But it was the Dung Engelbart 
type and was mouse. Doug An well, it was a, a little better than the original one that was a wooden box, yeah. but it still had two uh, discs. Right. So you, you, it was kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch. You right. can't draw a 45 degree line with an etch go up and over and up and over. <laughs> it was designed as a pointing device right. to point to some text. Right. But it wasn't a good drawing device. That wasn't really until uh, I think uh, Kelly is a design firm that worked with Apple to put the ball in there. They thought of a ball. And a ball mouse. Funnily, you could actually draw yeah. in, a, in a smooth shape. Yeah. Uh, it was my, I actually convinced, uh, I think Tom Whitney was the manager who had to make the call, but I convinced him that the mouse had to be in the box. Why? I had worked on the Apple II a bunch, and they had these uh, game I.O. paddles that, you know, little knobs and... Many people didn't have them, so if you wrote software, you didn't couldn't count on them. Right. And I said, how are you going to write a, uh, a graphics editing program that might have to work all by cursor keys? Can't do it. If you know they have a pointing device right. of any kind, I don't care whether it's a mouse or a pen or, or something else, but if yeah. they have a pointing device, then you can do something by point and drag. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom Whitney bought into that, and that was why there was a mouse in the box. Will Atkinson, what a hero of mine. We'll see more of him in 2017. Another hero, the guy who invented Java, James Gosling. Of course, Java, was it an instant success? Or did it, did it I remember very well uh, in the 94 or 95, Kim Police coming and showing us this new thing that uh, the, everybody was gonna, gonna move to. And by the way, it is a huge success. It's right now the number one most used language in the world, I think. Um, but was it an instant? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, astonishing that it, that it you know, it's amazing, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and partly because uh, it's not just people using Java. They're, the JVM is being used by, and I know you worked for a Scala company for a while. It's been closure well, I, and so I, many I, other... I've been on an advisory board. On advisory board, yeah. And so many other languages on top of it. The JVM is a brilliant uh, abstraction that uh, is powering probably... A, a significant portion of the software everybody watching is using, including, of course, and we'll get to this in a moment, <laughs> your Android device. Not, not without some, some problems along the way. Uh, but was it was it an interesting success out of the box? I mean, uh, did, did did people yeah, jump, I mean, jump it on was, it? it was it was it was really different. Um, you know, my 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 wife sort of beat me into writing this. Um, uh, white paper that was the, the that was the sort of series of stories of how it solved different problems and um, lots of people sort of grabbed onto it and went hey this is really really cool and um, I, I was completely blown away um, you know when there was a there was a point where you know you know when you have a you know, when you work for a company, you often have to write out your, like, annual goals. And as we were coming up to sort of, you know, we had sort of decided that this should go from being a research project to something that we would distribute. Um, I, you know, my, my manager asked me to, like, write something in my goals for, you know, what would count as success. And I think my, my, my success goal was was, like, you know, if a thousand people downloaded it and tried it out, I'd consider that success. <laughs> and and um, um, the, my uh, sort of manager at the time, um, he, he he thought I was being pretty edgy. He thought that that would be kind of difficult to achieve. Um, and I rather grotesquely overachieved on that one. <laughs> Oracle today says there's six and a half million Java programmers in the world. I bet you that number's low. And uh, every time I install Java now, it says something like, there, did you know there are a billion devices running Java? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I mean part, of the, part of that math is sort of, is sort of strange because um, Java is at the core of the, most of the, the, the smart card specs. So... Um, you know, all, you know, there, 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 there are Java virtual machines, you know, inside smart cards. No kidding, really. Uh, and inside uh, SIM cards and cell phones. You're kidding. There's an actual yeah. JVM inside this, in that little dumb chip. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and they're 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 like like um, you know, lots of ID cards. That's amazing. 
Well, lots of the more advanced ID cards have JVMs in them. That's a proof of concept. How did your wife know that you should do that? Is she a computer scientist? No, no, but um, she, you know, shows. So, so, so my wife's a, a very sharp lady. Um, you know, one of these sort of Wharton MBA types. Um, and, you know, I'd be like really excited about what I was doing and, you know, being a nerd, I'd, I'd always, you know, express my excitement in sort of nerd speak. And, um, she was, she was always like, come on, you know, you, you know, when you're explaining something, um, it makes no sense to like dive into nerd speak. It's like, for me, a non-nerd, what problems does this solve? That's a good point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 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 that's been a, sort of a mantra for me. You know, e you know, ever since um, that. You know, if you've got something exciting, you have to, and you're trying to explain it to somebody, you have to explain it in terms that make sense to the listener, not the speaker. Right. You know, so so like like there was this list of like sort of a dozen cool things, and and so like like the the architecture neutral aspect of the of the byte codes, um, you know, the fact that 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 that, that meant that, for instance, a, a hardware manufacturer could could swap chips somewhat painlessly. Yeah. Um, you know that's not sort of exciting for a for a nerd, but it sure is exciting for a like a purchasing manager. Sure. Um, you know, so you have to you know explain it in a way that makes sense to your audience. And um, my wife spent a lot of time twisting my arm on that. <laughs> Nerds need need somebody to help explain what's going on to real people. Yep. Now, one of the most fun things we did on Triangulation this year, I got to play with the new PlayStation VR long before it came out, and I had a lot of fun. Here's Richard Marks, the director of PlayStation's Magic Lab and PlayStation VR. So I've got the moves in my hands. Now I should be able to see them. You're just going to use the triggers, yep. Okay. And once it starts, you'll, uh, you won't loading, see the moves, so. you'll see your hands, kind of virtual hands. In oh, that's space. interesting. So the moves become the hands. Yep. And they could be whatever you need in the in VR, right? So it could be any kind of right, thing. Right. So I'm going to start you up here. Okay. And there's this audio here, so you're hearing some, you know, kind of audio. Maybe. Outskirts of London. Oh, mate, you're a legend. What? Oh, yeah. lit that place up like a Christmas tree. Who's this? Is this somebody? Rufus, little bar. So oh. he's your driver. He's off to your right. You can maybe even hear. Jason that. Statham is in the car with me, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, he's to my right. So you do get this sense of. Now we're still waiting for video, visual, visuals. Yeah, so it's kind of easing you into it again with audio first. Oh, I'm in a car. Boy, yep. Hey. Keep your eyes peeled. Okay. So that's my buddy. Yep. And uh, I got a, let's see. Oh, I can have a, a soda. Uh, throw that away. What's in here? Oh, there's another. Would you expect gloves? Yeah. Yeah, I did, actually. It's a glove box. Oh. I have a feeling these will be useful. Those look like bullets there. Yep. All right. You can keep that open maybe for later. Should I keep you that? Might, am I going to use that? Little, might get a little hectic soon. You're, you're this not, is you're, fun. We're just driving down the freeway. You can open the door if you're a brave I can? soul. Yeah. All right. Whoa. You're, you're a brave soul. Whoa. <laughs> Let's keep that close. <laughs> okay, so this is actually you, a great you, experience. You can actually turn on the radio if you're hurry. Like yeah, you can change. That's the station, and then the other one's the volume. Yeah, there you go. You can hear that. There's a lot of stuff you can do in the car. Oh, whoa, hey, oh, jeez. Somebody's shooting at me. That's not good. So this is a kind of, it feels to me like a classic PlayStation game. I mean, right. it's got that experience. Whoa, hello. And so that exact thing that just happened is very different from you than for us watching it. because it, it, it came at me. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you, Nate, uh, Jason. <laughs> yeah. Now That's I can... not exactly who that is, just so you know. No, no, that would be a violation <laughs> yeah. of... Uh, Oh my gosh, let's get this gun. Um, shoot his wheels out, you said. Oh, that worked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the tires worked really well. They were like, oh. kind of like an action movie where, you know, <laughs> you're somehow you shoot them and it doesn't seem to get them, but then you shoot the tire and it worked perfect. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I can't shoot that. Oh, that's it. You can, it's just a lot harder. They're harder to hit. Oh, I need more. Uh, yeah, the so you can put. Is... Yeah, that's. You know what? This is very natural, I have to say. Don't mind me. Yeah, thank you. Oh, he gets out of the way. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. He tries. Should I. Um, I got. I think I got that tire. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, four. yeah. Oh, there we go. Hey. Out of. Oh man. Thank goodness it's a uh, 
unlimited supply of bullets in here. <laughs> in the demo, maybe in the real game. Oh, it might not like be that. quite like this, huh? I'm shooting the car up. I'm sorry about that, Nathan. Jason. I'll call him Nathan, that way no one Nathan knows. Nathan Drake? Yeah, that Nathan Statham. He's his brother. He never really had the success. <laughs> this is, you know what, this is fun. Because you really, I know it's not, and I, sh I feel bad because I know it's not as fun for you at home watching. But just to give you an idea. Yeah, I think I'm. You re it's quite vivid. What's the resolution of this compared to uh, the competition? Is it is it pretty similar or? So it's similar. There is different ways to measure resolution. But yeah. It's a 1080p display, and okay. for every pixel, there's like a red, a green, and a blue subpixel. So I would expect Sony to do good displays in this. I mean, yeah. that's. And it, and it has really good optics that match the display really well. Uh, well, I think one thing I noticed immediately, the latency is zero. <laughs> so there's a real sense of, you know, uh, immediacy. And that's one of the things I think that bothers people um, with VR experiences. Even the even a millisecond latency is enough. Oh, I'm going to have to open the door on this guy. So, so of just course, to, don't mind me. I'm just... Uh... Of course, <laughs> it's impossible to make a zero latency. But what, what we do is predict forward a little bit. Oh, interesting. That's an interesting... I'm looking at you as if... <laughs> All I'm seeing is some guy, yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, this is super fun. The other thing is the headset is displaying at 120 frames per second. Ah. Which is, which is another difference. Yeah, that makes a big difference. So there's no, there's no stuff. He's throwing, by the way, excuse the profanity, but my friend here is a gangster. What are you? <laughs> That's Richard Marks. And I, ha I have to say that since the PlayStation VR has come out, we have one down the hall. It's become really the highlight of visiting the studio here. We had uh, an Oculus Rift, we had a uh, Vive, but the PlayStation VR turned out to be the easy, fun, big hit when it comes to VR. Coming up in just a bit, we're going to talk to Scott McNeely, a legendary CEO. But first, a word from our sponsor, Blue Apron. Blue Apron's been a sponsor of Triangulation all year long, and I love telling all of the people who listen to Triangulation, I hope that's you, uh, about Blue Apron, because... Their mission is something I can really get behind. They want to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, build a more sustainable food system, set the highest standards for ingredients, and build a community of home chefs. I love all of that, and I love Blue Apron. You know how it is at the end of the day. You've worked hard nine to five or whatever, and last thing you want to do, last thing you want to hear is, what's for dinner? But that So that means meal planning, right? you got to... Plan a menu, go to the store, shop for ingredients, come home, cook the ingredients, serve your family. What's for dinner? <sighs> That's why we often end up, don't we, at uh, Applebee's <laughs> or the Olive Garden or Burger King. Look, I got a better idea. At least a few days a week. It's so great to come home and see that Blue Apron box on your doorstep. Three different meals, three different dinners, or it could be lunch, I guess, in that box. Every ingredient you need to make an amazing dish and some wild dishes too, uh, but they're all incredibly delicious. No more, no less. By the way, if you need a single clove of garlic, that's what you get. You don't, you don't get, uh, you know, eighteen stalks of celery when you only need one. But you also get a beautiful recipe card, perfect for saving for later. It's laminated with the step-by-step -step instructions, much more than a cookbook. Pictures. A lot of detail, and they even have more detail on their website with videos like how to chop and things if you don't even know that. So you can really learn how to cook with Blue Apron. Use ingredients you've never seen before in many cases that will really broaden your horizons. And, man, these mouth-watering meals are incredible. I want you to visit blueapron.com and take a look at what's on the menu this year. They don't repeat within a year, so every time you get a box, it's something different. And you pick, by the way, what you get. You pick the date it comes and, and all of that so that... You know, there's no surprises here. How about steak tonight? How about this? Steak and green peppercorn sauce with kale and roasted potato. Now, you might say, oh, I don't want kale. Oh, wait till you see how they do it. <gasps> it it make you a kale lover. Cod, I love this. Cod en papillote. That's a French technique. It's a kind of a wrapping technique with frica. I don't know what that is. And spinach. But I bet you, once I try it, I'm going to love it. See, this is the beauty of Blue Apron. It is so much fun. By the way, they have plans for couples, but also plans for families. And I tell you, families that cook, that, that do Blue Apron tend to cook together more often. I think their statistics are three times more often because of Blue Apron. Blue Apron delivers right to your door in 99% of the continental United States. The food is fresh, never frozen, and it comes from 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers. The food you would buy in the grocery store. But believe it or not, because they don't have a brick-and-mortar store, 
that the store is 60% more expensive than Blue Apron. So this is a great deal, too. It doesn't cost you more to make a wonderful meal for your family. Bring them all together. Potato and artichoke quiche with romaine and orange salad. Seared pork chops with farro, Brussels sprouts, and cranberry chutney. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Blueapron.com slash twit. Make this your New Year's resolution. Let's cook together more often. By the way, guys, I get scouts too, but guys, great for date night. You want to impress a young lady? I know you'll never cook for her again, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, you light a couple of candles, you make an amazing meal. Blueapron.com slash twit. We thank Blue Apron for their support of Triangulation. Scott McNeely is a legendary CEO. Everybody, uh, you know, I mean, not because, not merely because he's a great businessman, one of the founders of Sun. Really, I think people like me like him because he is so outspoken. Most CEOs will never say anything out of the ordinary. Scott will always speak his mind, and he did exactly that. When he joined us this week, this year on a triangulation to talk about his newest project, Way In. Watch. Uh, when you first started Way In, it was uh, what is kind of social media startup. What, tell me exactly what what it is now and what it was then. Well, we we saw the cloud computing, the network as the computer was going to definitely start to impact the whole marketing experience much more aggressively. We're not the only company to have figured it out, and there's lots of little companies out there doing social listening, uh, doing analytics, doing uh, engagement and uh, digital campaign tools, all the rest of it. And we went after that marketplace. Uh, we thought we would be a network, a social network while we were doing that, but Pinterest and Snapchat and all the others have won. So we decided to ride and use those technologies. So we ingest the entire social media conversation in real time. We tag and index it sort of like Google does the uh, uh, the web, we do the social media conversation. I call it crowd noise. We index it and allow you to filter and search it and find uh, social uh, golden needles in that uh, haystack uh, of social crowd noise and then apply them to authentic campaigns to do uh, quizzes and, and uh, uh, do uh, sweepstakes and coupons and photo upload contests, all the rest of it, and provide a wonderful end-to-end -end cloud digital marketing experience that allows you to uh, interact with huge numbers of uh, of clientele out there. In fact, the uh, way in today has engaged one in seven humans on the planet. Wow. Which is kind of a stunning, uh, excuse me, one in 14. And we have a uh, line of sight to getting to one in seven uh, humans on the planet and we are capturing the first party data uh, of those engagements. Uh, by the end of this year, we think we'll have one in seven people who have engaged wow. in our digital campaigns. So what, what I like about this is you focus on uh, uh, authenticity. It's not, it's an unusual kind of uh, way of marketing, something that uh, my, my friends, Doc Searles, uh, uh, kind of with the Clue Train Manifesto many years ago, uh, said that marketing now, it's about conversations. It's about talking to your customers directly as opposed to kind of, as you say, megaphone uh, marketing. Exactly right. And uh, that that one on one, it, it turns out that people trust a, uh, a social post far more than they trust the the marketing campaign done by the Madison Avenue ad agency. What, people, a, what, a, what a surprise. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think this is. I think this is. A, it's very different from uh, your start, from uh, how you began. It's probably refreshing to to try uh, different things. New well, things. it's actually uh, pretty similar in in many ways, uh, in the sense that when I started in the computer industry, there were hundreds of uh, APIs, which were the microprocessor operating system user interface binary. Uh, environment and you had to decide if you're going to write an application or add value to a platform which one did you do data general did you do DAC did you do one of five IBM APIs or did you do Apple or PC or Sun or whatever and if you think about uh, the marketing world we sort of have and, and, and we ended up with what I call the Frankenstein data center where you brought in all these little different pieces and it was very proprietary and very constrained the marketing directors today have that same problem. They have to buy their listening tool from here, their uh, their analytics from there, their uh, publishing tools from there, and they're building these own their own little um, Frankenstein's or Franken suites, if you want to call them, 
uh, in, in the in the CMO's office, and they're becoming IT directors. We're trying to put together a new age, new generation, scalable, integrated from the ground up, uh, carrier grade, open API, clearly architected uh, cloud architecture that allows uh, these digital campaigns to happen. And what's also interesting, uh, very much like in the distributed computing space where people went from the mainframe to truly distributed network computing, people today, three quarters of the media buys are still in the traditional print and media megaphone buys. But we had the big kaboom last year where worldwide people are now spending more time in front of a digital screen like we all are right now than they are in front of uh, a, a TV screen. So that big change has happened, yet the advertising and media buys and campaigns have not transitioned. So there's this massive uh, gap between where people are spending today versus uh, where the uh, user is today. We're looking back at 2016 and some of the best interviews on triangulation. And when I look at this list, I think, gee, we, this, is, this, fun, this show is fun. I have a lot of fun. We'll be back, of course, in the new year, starting uh, the day after uh, New Year's Day, January 2nd. With I'm, I, I don't know who we're interviewing, but it's going to be somebody great. I do know who we have interviewed, including another one of my heroes. He was one of the founding uh, fathers of the uh, Whole Earth Catalog, The Well. He's one of our great tech journalists, Kevin Kelly. He's talking about the future. It's called The Inevitable, and I love that. Um, and this is, you're going to talk about the next 20 years and uh, I think a dozen innovations or technological forces that will shape those next couple of decades. Right, exactly. And that's primarily about digital technology and the ways in which it's going to roll out and affect our lives. Yeah. A lot of the things we've heard about, my premise is that much of what's coming, we don't have much choice about, is going to be coming anyway, no matter what we do. But we have a lot of choice in how we do it. Unintentionally, it started to become a theme of this show because we talked to a lot of people who are talking about the coming future and getting a lot of perspectives on it. I think, you know, this is a technology network, so we like to talk about the cool technologies around us. And I'm always a little nervous about uh, predictions because, uh, you know, that's one of the things you learn, and I, and I know you know, covering this field for so long, is it's unpredictable. And yet, I think you're right. I think we can kind of see the, the outline of the future through the fog ahead of us. Right. So, so I would say, in a certain sense, that the Internet, say, was inevitable, but Twitter was not. Exactly. T telephony, telephones were inevitable. Any planet you go on where they invented electricity, they're going to eventually invent telephones. But the iPhone was not inevitable. So the larger megatrends are very clear in part because they've already started. But the specifics, the particulars are completely unpredictable. And you're, 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 it's a fool's game to even try and predict those. Right. So we're not going to worry about that, but we will talk about the kind of outline, the shapes. Exactly. Those those large genres, the the big the big things, which are have decades of momentum. So they've already been operating, and they will continue to go and increase in the next 20, 30 years. Those are the things I'm talking about. So you know, it's like imagine if 40 years ago, somebody from the future came and they said, "Hey, here's where this is going. For the next 40 years, every year, computers would get." Twice as fast, half as cheap, wow. twice as small for right. the next 40 years. Right. They didn't need to tell you anything about IBM or Apple. All, all you need to know is that Megatrend was going to be true reliably. Imagine what you could do. I mean, you first of all, if you wanted to be wealthy, you could be as wealthy as you wanted to just on that information. But you could also prepare our schools. You could prepare your own career. You could prepare politics to accept the fact that this is going to happen. And that's sort of what we're talking about now. That's what I use the word megatrends. Wasn't that was it Alvin Toffler? No, that was John Nashbit. Nashbit, that's right. Who yeah. had a, a book called Megatrends. Alvin Toffler's idea, his key thing was future shock. Future shock, yeah. Which meant that there was this ongoing state of anxiety <laughs> that we'd have about the future. 
which is not far off. I think that's proven right. true. Have have Nashbit's uh, mega trends? Uh, I mean, you you before before you embarked upon this journey, did you look back to see what others yes, said twenty years I, and yes, thirty years yes. ago? Actually, his mega trends were fairly good. I think the, one of them was this high tech, high touch. Yep. This idea that while the more and more that we made technology and this sort of intangible, that we'd also have this movement towards the well, the touch, the kind of like what we now would think of as sort of the authentic, the, the um, you know, the expensive artisanal breads and things like that. So I think he was actually pretty good on most of his megatrends. That was 1982. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of the same distance. I mean, I, I suppose someday, 30 years from now, somebody will look back at the inevitable and see, was right, it? They'll was say, it? <laughs> how, how, how did how I do? How inevitable and what was, was it? it? You know, All when right, we so designed this studio, it was at Nesbitt's high-tech, high-touch that I kept in mind. And in fact, I've always done that when we've done our shows. We try to take human touches and humanize what would, you know, a lot of times technology, it's, it's brushed metal and the future and cyber bots and Borgs. Yeah. And I wanted to make it, uh, you know, we have an old radio here. I wanted to really make it tactile and real and physical and less uh, scary. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think that's the way to go. And, and I think everyone's wrong about imagining the future as being this kind of Star Trek with all these right. clean, sterile lines, when in fact it's much closer to the kind of Star Wars, Star Wars world where you have the new layered on top of the old right and and, and there's kind of the worn the worn future um or blade and, and runner think, blade runner maybe or blade why we love like blade runner so much it was a yeah. gritty kind of dark future a noir future but that, but you know i talk about high technology new technology but but i want to be very clear that most of the technology in the future is going to be old stuff <laughs> if you look, if you look around your room, look at my around my room is mostly old old technology, concrete, wood, pipes, electrical stuff that's been around. That's the majority of the stuff, and in the future, that's going to be exactly the same thing. Um, we'll, we'll still have you know TCIP in, in in a thousand years from now. Yeah, we will. Yes. <laughs> you sure? It's like it's like you know it's, it's, a, it's like ATP cycles in 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 cells you know that they, they haven't there. changed in millions of years. TCP/IP is the new ATP. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like that. For so many years, people would call up uh, and ask me on call for help. The screensavers, the radio show. I've got. I'm building a house. I've got the walls open. What kind of wire should I put in the walls? And I always said, oh yeah, you know, put Cat five in or whatever. <laughs> then along comes Wi-Fi. And who needs wires anymore? Well, Case Links is the guy who invented it. Listen. So how did you start doing wireless? Well, actually, uh, just running into, uh, into some friends and, um, and uh, talking with each other. What, what was getting quite popular in, uh, and I'm talking now late 80s, uh, mm -hmm. the previous century. Early days of the PC revolution. Early days of the PC, but you had cordless phones. That's right. No cellular phones. That's well, right. they were just just being invented. But cordless phones were at, somewhat, and they were at 900 megahertz to 700 900 megahertz. megahertz. These big things with yeah. these long antennas. Yeah, yeah. So and and you know this was kind of um, uh, having a chat at an uh, at a McDonald's or uh, you know. There's uh, a McDonald's in Utrecht. There's a McDonald's in Utrecht, <laughs> and uh, we said. Wouldn't, That's sad. Would, now I'm now I'm sad. <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if there would be? Well, I mean. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be nice if it would be something like Wi-Fi? We didn't call it Wi-Fi in those years, but yet cordless phones, why wouldn't you have cordless computers? What a convenience. Before uh, cordless phones, you had this long cord, you right. could get wrapped around right. you. Right. Um, so it was easy to see that that was a technology that made sense for consumers. That's what you would think. But we had products in, uh, in the early 90s, and people didn't believe it could work. Um, they thought, you know, your data got lost in the air. Uh, people are concerned <laughs> about health. There were a they're thousand. They're still concerned about health. And they're still concerned about they health. They never stopped. Right? But um, now the very interesting thing is we had first products early uh, 1990, 1991, and the real market breakthrough was 1999 with, I could, with Apple. Yeah, you convinced Steve Jobs that Wi-Fi was the thing. Well, I got a call from Steve Jobs that he was looking for something that uh, that we had, something like wireless that uh, he wanted to use to differentiate uh, his uh, his iBook with, compared to other laptops in the market. So laptops didn't have Wi-Fi. 
Uh, until 1999. You, you Ethernet connected them. What you maybe remember these pocket LAN adapters? Yes, uh, I remember. You, they were you, like a you, credit card. They were the PCMCIA cards. No, even before that, you had uh, you plugged it into your printer port, and, <laughs> oh, then, and then you plugged your That's Ethernet right. card in there. It, it was a Centronics port on the back. Exactly. <sighs> exactly. I do remember that. That's and, you, and then it was really a modem as much as... Uh, and you had the modems, right? Yeah. The, the What is it? The, exactly. Well, that, replacing that modem, that was the first thing, you know. Yeah. You had always had that wire to yeah. the phone line. And yeah. we said, you know, can we do that wireless? Um, yeah. So replacing that wire was, was the first... But the funny part is today, if I ask my son, do you know there was life before Wi-Fi? <laughs> You know, I was in the early 90s doing computer talk sh radio shows, and people would say, oh, yeah, we're going to build a house. What should we do for... Uh, it wasn't Internet in those days, because people weren't Correct. going online to the mid-90s. Right. Uh, but So maybe it was a little bit later. And you'd always say, oh, yeah, well, you definitely want to put uh, Cat5 in the... Uh, in the wall and maybe coax your cable. We have Cat5 in was, every room in our house. It's so wrong. <laughs> How wrong can it be, right? How Who wrong? knew that it was gonna, that was the wireless revolution totally took over. Case Link's the creator of Wi-Fi. Now Nathan Freitas is here. Uh, I'm a big fan, as you probably know, of open source. I use Linux, I use open source software whenever I can. And I feel like the future of software in many respects is this open source movement. But what? how does it happen? What does it mean? Nathan Freitas is here. He's with the Guardian Project. He talks about why open source is important. Our guest, Nathaniel Freitas, is a fellow at the Berkman Center, Berkman Klein Center for uh, uh, the Internet at Harvard University. He's also a software guy, wrote a chat program we've talked about before, Chat Secure, based on XMPP, based on all open technologies using OTR. Uh, it's, it supports, uh, you know, all of, all, all of the features you want. iPhone and Android. And actually, I note yep. that Orbot is not iPhone. There are limits to what you can do on the iPhone. And yeah, we, uh, there is a partner Tor community project called Onion Browser that's available. Okay. And we're working with them to take it up a notch and... It's actually great. The developer's been charging for it, um, so he's been able to sustain himself. It's open source, so if you want to build it yourself, you can. But he does charge, I think, ninety nine cents, and it's actually been, you know, paying his rent basically while he's uh, doing it. But yes, you're right. The, the The main difference between iOS and Android is that you can run Tor and build encryption and do all of these things on iOS, but it has to operate in a single pro uh, process. It can't run in the background. Right. Um, and so with, with Orbot, we can actually, it's more like Linux. You can start it up. It runs in the background. Apps like Facebook can tie into it and our browser and the Twitter app. So your browsing uh, can, can all, all be through, kind of all be through Tor as if you had a, yeah. uh, uh, that's kind of the ideal way to do it. So you're, Yeah, it's a VPN. It has a VPN feature that tunnels using nice. the VPN yeah. through. Um, and, and really, it you know, it's really just the first step. Um, we're starting to do things like, you know, use it to build um, like a, a onion drive, onion share kind of feature. Um, so the idea of just browsing through it are, is one thing, but the idea of actually running services on your phone um, for synchronization, for sharing peer to peer through through onion addresses, um, is it's, there's so much that a phone can do. It's really amazing uh, how much processing power and storage there are. And um, so we're, you know, we're. Definitely doing more with Orbot in the future. Yeah, and after all, this is the main, com now for almost everybody, this is their primary computing device. This is where they're getting online most of the time. Yeah, So absolutely. it's important to, to pay attention to this. Um, why open source? I I have a personal answer and then a more strategic professional answer. Okay. Um, you know, when I, I, I worked, I've worked in mobile for a long time. I'm, the company I worked for in, in the late 90s in New York was the first BlackBerry reseller. Um, in New York, I was a programmer then. I've, I've created so much technology and so many apps. I started a company, Palm acquired us. And then when, you know, Palm became sort of disinterested in mobile enterprise, secure enterprise, um, wireless communication, all of this intellectual property and contribution I had created to the world really was gone, was, was taken away from me, was, was, you know, was stuck within the, the, the corporate environment. And I, you know, I was paid, that's a fair exchange. But in many ways, I felt it was a disservice kind of to the state of the world, the state of security and mobile devices, because they did nothing with it, right? And I, and I felt like this void of my life, like, what did I do in that, you know, 10-year period, basically? So um, I sort of vowed never again to, um, 
to write code that was closed source or that you know I couldn't get an open source license to reuse elsewhere. So it's it's more about what I want to do with my life and how I want to contribute. I think the second piece is that what we're finding is obviously through things like GitHub, which are, it's not just open source, it's also the community aspects of open source, right? And the collective building of things. So with the modular nature of programming with, you know, social networks like GitHub essentially allowing you to find, you know, what's the best code for this? What's the best code for this? And then it really just accelerates the process for building new technologies so that you know, we're not all reinventing the same, uh, you know, routines and functions and methods over and over again. Um, and, and so that's key as well. And then on, on the security front, you know, the idea of, you know, security by obscurity, you know, it's this weird intuition people have, like, isn't it better if we keep how we're doing security secret? Because then you know, have to figure it out first. And that's just so misaligned from the actual science of the way this goes, which is, even if your adversary knows how your encryption works, it still has to work. Um, they still can't crack it even if they know how it works. And so the ability for open source technology to be transparent uh, when it comes to security and be audited and be shared and reused. So technologies like PGP, uh, off the record encryption is key. And now, you know, the Axolotl now lib signal protocol from, uh, from Moxie and Trevor is key. To That's the one that WhatsApp and Facebook are uh, now exactly. using. Exactly. Well, and every, I mean, it's the Everybody new gold standard. It. Yeah. Some very, standard. everyone's, people are, yeah. So yeah. that right there shows both that, um, you know, this is what we need to, to change. Like, I'm not creating a startup. I'm trying to influence the world to, right. to veer towards a positive direction on security and privacy. And, and so is Moxie. And, you know, we had, six years ago, we both started tinkering around with Android and, I went kind of the tour route and he went the messaging route. And uh, <laughs> it's amazing to see what he's, the impact that, that he and his team have been able to have. I mean, billion, a billion people got end in encryption instantly. Like that. Like Isn't that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's so cool. Before there was the World Wide Web, before there was uh, Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, there were things like Gopher and Archie and Veronica, the early protocols of the internet, including pop mail. Here's the guy who created the Mark McKay Hill. I loved this interview. He is uh, an internet pioneer. I love talking to internet pioneers and uh, the creator of some of the protocols that you probably still use pop mail. Many of people still use pop mail, although it's being slowly superseded by IMAP. You probably don't regret that, Mark. No. No. It's time, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I mean, this stuff isn't forever. Yeah. Ideally, someone comes up with something better that, you know, displaces the old stuff. It must be kind of fun, though, to go to somewhere like, you know, QUX.org and see a Gopher server running and be able to browse it. And it's in a way, you know, we had Ward Cunningham on a little while ago, and I have a feeling Wiki was probably also very much influenced by what you were doing with Gopher. The idea yep. of links and digging down and references is just a compelling idea. Yeah, and I think another piece that makes this stuff all hang together is the idea that once you have this kind of distributed information system with a bunch of links and things spread around, you got to have some kind of search engine to go with it. Right. So what almost all well, what always comes with those things is some sort of robot that goes and crawls through the whole hierarchy and yeah. then indexes it and makes it searchable. So Gopher had that stuff way before anything like Google is, existed. So you had a, a spider, a crawler that would go out and look at Gopher sites and, and aggregate it. And then were the sites, were you also doing federation of the content? Yeah. Uh, actually, the guys who are doing, um, where were they? Nevada? University of Nevada, there were some guys who were doing... Uh, a thing that would crawl across the internet gopher space and make an index of it that was searchable. Uh, they called it Veronica, uh, which, oh, bothered, Archie's which, bothered, which bothered the guys who did Archie, Peter Deutsch and Alan M. Tosh hated that name. They, they really did because they were nervous that uh, oh, the comic yeah. guy, the right. comic book guys, were going to get after them for using the name Archie. I was oh. like, no, 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 that's copyright. Don't, don't, don't be doing that. But uh, we talked to the guys from uh, the UNR who did this and uh, said, well, you know, Veronica is pretty good and we could probably come up with some kind of acronym. So, you know, it's so it was very easy, rodent oriented network, something. <laughs> <on that. laughs> 
<laughs> uh, that's called a retronym, right? Where you have the name yeah. and then you go backwards and say, what could that stand for? Yeah. Oh, but see? You... See, Your Honor, we weren't thinking of comic books at all. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> but if you think about it, so you had FTP, which was the de facto distributed information system before Gopher got any kind of traction at all. And the uh, Archie guys went and did a crawler and did a search index. Um, and that was really cool. And then we did Gopher, and the same thing happened there. And then the web came, and the same thing happened there. That It always happens because you need sure. some way to search the stuff. Sure. That makes that, – yeah, it's no good if you have a – well, and that was the really – that was the thing that, that really made a difference. It really changed things was, uh, you know, you go to the library – and search is very primitive. You go to a card catalog in the old days, go to a card catalog and it's alphabetical. And then there's this weird Dewey decimal system and you had to kind of know that. And it was just, it was very primitive. So it makes sense that as soon as you've got information digitized, you want to take a step beyond the card catalog, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at what happened back then. This is right when microcomputers are getting really popular now everybody's making the content using microcomputers so it's all digital already yeah. now there's also cheap connectivity and the internet with the idea of federating this stuff made it so we're in this perfect storm of everything's turning digital and it's cheap to connect and there's the idea of categorizing it and there's the idea of making it searchable even though it's spread all over the world uh, that's where the popularization of the internet came yeah, from. Yeah. And we happen to be at the right place at roughly the right time, along with quite a few other people. I mean, I look at Peter Deutsch and Alan Emtage doing the Archie stuff. They were doing the same kind of popularization. They were just working on the older tech. And what Tim Berners-Lee and company were up to was, again, the same idea of, hey, we could take this digital stuff and make it much easier to get at. So it was a fun time. Very but, easy, rodent-oriented, net-wide index to computer archives. Ah, there you go. <laughs> the chat room is good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Eric Duckman knew that or looked it up, but either way, uh, that's that's a retronym for you. That yep. Is, that is awesome. So, our, But Archie was the first search engine for Gopher. Well, it was the first search engine for FTP sites. Oh, Archie was FTP, that's right. But what we were doing with Gopher was to make Gopher look bigger and plumper than it really was, <laughs> since there weren't initially there aren't that many people running those servers. Right. We wrote a gateway between Gopher and FTP, so all of the FTP oh. sites appeared from the Gopher client as if you know it's just more Gopher stuff. It became an interface to FTP, in effect. And so you'd also want the interface to the search engine. And that, right. the same sort of thing happened then when the web starting to get more popular. Initially, there weren't that many websites, so they also would support Gopher and kind of embrace and extend. Uh, everybody was doing that to make their thing able to get to pretty much everything else. It's actually uh, interesting that Gopher's still around and Gopher's still being run. And in fact, uh, you can still run your own Gopher server. The Federation still exists. If you go to QUX, you'll find a list of a number of other Gopher servers that you can link to. And you could still do kind of what we did in the earliest days of the Internet and hop around from server to server and find interesting stuff. And it really is a, a rabbit hole that you fall down because you go, you click that and you go, oh, and you click that and you go, oh, and you, by the, <laughs> by the time you're done, it's late at night and you haven't had dinner. <laughs> I remember it well. <laughs> Thank God for software archaeologists. <laughs> Sometimes you pull strings to get a great interview. We've been pulling as many strings as we can to get Edward Snowden on the show. But but we, we had a little thread we could pull on for this next guest. It turns out he was my producer, Karsten Bondi's college roommate <laughs> and Edward Snowden's attorney, Ben Wisner from the ACLU, is next. To Laura Poitras... Uh, Poitras um, documentary is riveting and highly recommended. I think people should definitely see that before they see the uh, fictionalized version. But that yeah, that's I, that's accurate. That's actually was shot during the <laughs> events, right? Isn't that something? Yeah. That, uh, Amazing. That during, during this week that changed the world, the camera was rolling. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to her for being able to persuade him to allow the cameras to roll because people get to see who Snowden was during that time of maximum stress. 
Um, during that week, he fully expected that he would soon be in prison. Um, he thought these might be his last hours uh, in freedom, and he had a limited amount of time to transfer his knowledge and information to these journalists. Uh, and yet you see him in this film um, very calm, uh, very articulate, able to explain his motivation and his plan as clearly as possible. Uh, people who say that the Snowden who speaks around the world right now must be the product of media handlers need to just look at that movie and see who he was before he met any of us. He had never spoken to a lawyer uh, at the time that those scenes were shot. I, I'm very dramatically struck by after watching the movie by his... Uh, uh genuine fear and paranoia and and understanding of the far-reaching capabilities of the nsa um and 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 you know at first you watch it you think oh this guy's just really paranoid is he is he can he possibly be legitimately paranoid but as as these documents have come out uh we realize he understood better than anybody the capabilities of the nsa it, it's it's well, sure, like a he, jason he, bourne movie he knew what he could do from his workstation. Yeah. And he knew that there was a wide gap between what the rules might prohibit and what the NSA could legitimately control. Uh, and so he knew that there were thousands or tens of thousands of people sitting across the intelligence community uh, who had virtually unfettered access to the private lives of anyone in the world. All they needed was a search term, an email address, a phone number. Uh, when he said that he could call up the president's emails if he just had an email address, uh, he wasn't saying that the rules allowed that. He was saying that the technology made that capable and there was no audit system that would have detected that had he done that. And, and you know, we know that because, uh, after all, he walked out of the NSA uh, with some very, very highly sensitive things. And the NSA still doesn't know um, what was taken and what was not. They're still making wild guesses um, about what he took and gave to journalists. And they're waiting for articles to be published to find out. We haven't seen all the documents yet. Oh, no. And, I, I, and, and we never will, probably. Uh, it was never his intention that we would see all the documents or he could have just published them on the Internet himself. Right. Uh, what he wanted to do was put journalism in between uh, uh, his actions and the public. Um, he, as he says in Citizen Four, uh, he wanted a system that would correct for his own biases. He had spent his entire adult life in the intelligence community. He had very strong views. Uh, about what he thought was right and wrong, but he wanted to entrust the decision to journalists, their editors, their publishers, in consultation with the government, um, to make the very hard choices about what the public needed to see uh, in free societies. That was the thing that most impressed me and convinced me uh, that Snowden was a patriot. That's my personal uh, feeling, was that instead of just dumping it at WikiLeaks, uh, a treasure tro as others have done, a treasure trove of information and and let people sift through it he did what i thought was incredibly responsible which was to and not just give it to one newspaper to give it to several uh, right. let them vet the contents uh you know and and then and this is the one thing that's a little difficult for me and then spin it out slowly i realize the value of spinning it out slowly is we can look at it individually and it's and and it keeps our attention um, there may also be this cynical notion that, well, we'll also continue to generate content for years to come and the Intercept has benefited, I, I Glenn, but Glenn Greenwald think, has benefited. I don't think that's what's going on, Leo. I think that, that in the beginning there was obviously a strategy not to publish 10 stories every week because yeah. the public would so not have been able to digest it. Yeah. Uh, but I think that after a few months, a lot of the low-hanging fruit had already been published. Um, the, the things in the archive that were, you know, memos or court orders that very clearly explain what the government was doing. And, and, and most of it is much, much harder to report on. Uh, if you've seen intelligence documents, they're complex technical PowerPoints, um, that they are diagrams. And so the, the news organizations have had to hire computer scientists, engineers, technologists to help them just understand uh, when this, what's in this archive and then to make uh, measured judgments about what the public ought to see and what they, they shouldn't see. So I don't think at this point any news organization is sitting on a story um, uh, out of any uh, you know, sort of strategy to, to sell newspapers or, uh, or extend the, the, the length of this debate. I think that if there were easy stories in there, they would have been published a yeah. long time ago. No, and I have uh, been but, satisfied. But one other thing, yeah. um, you, you know, you hear from NSA defenders and, and Snowden critics um, that he should not have gone to the press, that he should have gone somewhere 
within the chain of command. There must have been some channel that he should have gone through in government in order to raise this concern. And it's a very odd argument um, because, as President Obama correctly said in June of 2013, uh, the, the programs that were revealed by journalists from the Snowden Archive had been comprehensively approved by all three branches of government. The, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court had signed off on them. The Senate and House Intelligence Committees had been briefed on them. Uh, the president and the NSA director had authorized them. Uh, and it was only after the public was brought into the conversation through journalists that all three branches of government actually changed their minds about it. And open federal courts started saying these programs are illegal. Congress changed the law for the first time since the 1970s to take away spying power from the NSA. And the president admitted that the programs had gone too far. So, so what was Snowden supposed to do in, in May of 2013? C call up the Senate Intelligence Committee and say, I'm a 29-year-old contractor and I want you to know about programs that you've approved in secret. Uh, the problem was that constitutional oversight had failed and we needed the fourth estate, the, the media, um, uh, put into the First Amendment to the Constitution for a reason by the framers uh, to reinvigorate democratic oversight. Well, one of the big highlights of the year, of course, the, the election. That's what pretty much all we could talk about all year long in the United States was our presidential election. And there was some concern raised by at least one of the candidates that the vote wouldn't be fair. I noticed since he won, he hasn't said that <laughs> anymore. But we were worried, and in particular, we were worried about certain kinds of voting machines. So that's why we got uh, a couple of people on from verifiedvoting.org. David Dill, one of its founders, and one of the great, the fathers of crypto, he's the R in RSA cryptography, Ron Rivest, to talk, uh, take, talk about electronic voting. And, how, and I love this. This is the, the kind of the piece towards the end where they explain what a perfect voting system would look like. So is, there, is there a perfect system? There's no perfect system, but I, I, there is a lot of research on better voting systems. Um, I'd like to point out one that's uh, underway right now. Actually, it, it's uh, uh, the one that's, hap that's called Star Vote. It's happening in Texas. Uh, the uh, um, What's her name? Clerk of uh, – Dana DeBovar is her name, but their, her office is uh, – she's clerk of uh, uh, the county of Travis County, which holds Austin, Texas as one of its things. And that was designed by a lot uh, – number of people it's based on paper ballots but it also has um some cryptography in there in nice ways uh yes there we go uh and uh it's in the, in the process of being uh developed and, and uh, i think there's an rfp out now for it uh, but it has lots of very nice properties for one thing here's a property you may not have heard of a voter can uh, go after the election to a website and check that their vote was recorded properly uh, and that's a delicate i love that yeah, it's nice. You go there and you just type in your name. But you, of course, have to verify that because otherwise it's not a private uh, vote. So there's some cryptography used. So you can't use that mechanism to sell your vote. It's okay. tricky. Okay. Uh, so your vote gets encrypted in a certain way and you have to be uh, looking How at the How do they authenticate? Uh, so it's an, a poll site voting system. So you go there in person to vote. Uh, so it's not an online voting. This, mm -hmm. this is only using the Internet for after the election verification that your vote was cast properly or not after the, the, the thing. So you, you go in, on election day, you go, you cast your paper ballot, it's scanned, electronic record is made. Um, and, and then uh, there's a website that has uh, an encrypted electronic version of that. Uh, posted and you can go and see. Yeah, there's a vote recorded for you, and and uh, it's the vote that it should be, uh, and it's done in a in a subtle cryptographic way that allows you to know that it's recording the right vote without you, allowing you to be able to sell it. So so I think that's a, a very promising direction. I look forward to seeing that roll out successfully. So my agenda would be uh, go to precinct can scanned. I, I like this star system as well, but if we go lower tech and use existing proven technology that doesn't require any research. Um, what I'd love to see is across the United States, precinct scan optical scan ballots. So, so that's where you put your ballot in the polling place into a scanner, uh, which counts the votes then and there. Um, coupled with more, uh, one, some of these better auditing systems that we've talked about. And then the very highest priority is to stop the, stop the deployment of systems that actually make the election system worse, right? So it's a sad thing that not only do we have to think about improving our voting system, we have to uh, avoid doing things that unimprove it. And uh, internet voting would be the very top of my list of things we shouldn't do. So all the geeks watching, and this show, of course, is primarily for geeks, 
Stop asking for online voting, internet voting. It's not a it's not a good idea. You can see we you can see uh, it's it's really interesting, and I agree with you, David, when you said that uh, if you're a serious uh, uh, technical person, you don't always vote for the most uh, high tech answer. Sometimes. Uh, Sometimes yeah, the key thing is there is the evidence. Solution. If you're a geek who wants to think about voting systems, the thing to think about is not only how do you make the counting accurate, but how do you make the evidence trail believable? Right. right. So you have to have uh, some kind of evidence trail that uh, is convincing to the loser that he lost fair and square. And if that evidence trail is produced by a corrupted computer, you've got a real problem. Right. The, Travis counting does allow early voting. Um, is that okay? Is that a good? I mean, it's still poll side, right? That's fine with me. Yeah. In fact, it's better because I, the whole notion of everybody voting all at once on a Tuesday is a kind of second Tuesday of November. It's kind of kooky. Well, yeah, I, I'd be in favor I think of it's, a national, ho national holiday for voting. There you go. Yeah. You know, some people have to work hard on Tuesdays. And right. so I like the idea that they can vote early. Yeah. So uh, early voting, but it's poll side voting. Uh, uh, they have uh, a large population in Travis County. So this is a good test. They're going to use uh, this uh, star system uh, this time around. They're in the process of getting it. Uh, I think it's an RFP out, so they need to get uh, okay. manufacturers to, to produce it. And so so on. they still need the hardware uh, to make this happen. That's right. But the work has been so, done. And the, there's a Usenix paper if people want to uh, read up on this. Uh, uh, yep. uh, Star Vote, a secure, transparent, audible, and auditable and reliable voting. So that, that's very interesting. I, I do agree with David's remarks, though, too, that you know, getting most – States most or all uh, uh, counties to use uh, precinct level optical scan is a, is a great next step for all of us to yeah, be doing. Yeah, and has the advantage of uh, quick results as well. Towards the end of the year, we had a great interview uh, with a woman who was a mathematician and then became a quant. You know what a quant is? One of the big brains that work for the uh, Wall Street hedge funds and and uh, and and really calculate these complicated uh, derivatives and formulas and. Kathy O'Neill was a quant and a mathematician. She soured a little bit on the job she was doing on Wall Street and has ended up being really a, a great spokesperson for math and understanding math so that you can understand how the world works. Her book, Weapons of Math Destruction, talks about data and, in this case, how it's used as a weapon against teachers. Give me some examples, uh, and, and your book is loaded with them, of how uh, the big data models are being misused today. Um, yeah, so I'll give you two examples. And um, I, you said it very well. It is, it is the opposite of what we were hoping for, for the internet. Um, the first example, though, is not an internet example. It's, um, it's an assessment model for teachers, um, public school teachers. And it stems from a sort of long... Um, a long campaign by many presidents to sort of be that president who fixed education, whatever that means. Um, well, what it means is we have a problem with an, what's called the achievement gap, which is that to say like rich kids um, are doing better on uh, standardized test scores than, um, than poor kids. And the idea is, well, we're going to close that achievement gap, which is a worthy goal. Um, but the, uh, the way we've d gone about it is we've been trying to find bad teachers to get rid of bad teachers. And um, finding bad teachers is, is much harder than it sounds. Um, and, and the argument is basically that principals will protect bad teachers. So we need to use some kind of objective mathematical um, scoring system to find those bad teachers. And actually there's been like more than one generation of, of such assessments. And the first one was really dumb. <laughs> it didn't work. But let me tell you what it was, because it sets up the, the one that actually I, I want to talk about. The first one was um, basically you labeled a teacher as a failing teacher if a large percentage of their students was not passing their standardized tests at some kind of proficiency um, uh, level, which is to say they weren't getting past a certain score on their standardized tests. Um, and the problem was, as I already mentioned, poor kids don't do as well as rich kids on tests. Um, that this was essentially putting the label of failure on on teachers of poor kids, and it, it wasn't fair because you know if you have a bunch of kids who that failed their third grade standardized test very badly, and you get half of them up to passing level on on fourth grade, but but still half of them are failing, then you've done a lot more good as a teacher um, than s somebody who was in fifth grade uh, who 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 started out with kids that all passed in third grade and then in fourth grade 
only 75% of them passed. So the idea was we have to somehow account for where they were a year ago in order to um, measure a teacher, whether they're passing or failing. So the second generation of this, of a teacher assessments, which is called the value added model, sometimes called the growth model, and there's different variations of it, but they essentially come down to this idea where you have an expected score for each of the student in your class. If you're a teacher of a class, every student in your class has an expected end of year score, and then they have the actual end of year score, what they get at the end of the year with you. So if their expected end of year score was 75, but they actually got an 80, um, you will be given credit for those five points. If they had an expected end of year score of 75, but they actually got a 70, then you're on the hook for those five points. So the idea is you are going to be on the hook for the difference between the expected and the actual scores. Now it sounds pretty reasonable, and it actually might be reasonable, if um, statistically speaking, it was ro it were a robust thing. Unfortunately, there's just so many sources of uncertainty for both that expected score and the actual score. Just to give you some idea, kids do better if they've eaten breakfast that day. Kids do better if it's not too hot in the classroom, and then some classrooms have air conditioning and some classes don't. Um, kids do better, you know, if they're if they're having a, a, a stable home life. There are all sorts of reasons that the actual score could be could vary for a given, into, given child. Um, so there's uncertainty in their actual score. There's also, of course, uncertainty in expected score. How do you guess what a score is gonna be in a year for a given kid? So anyway, the point is that those two numbers are both uncertain. And when you take the difference, you have even more uncertainty. And that kind of uncertainty, statistically speaking, it can, it can be accounted for if you have a large enough sample size. But think about it. Classrooms are 25 kids, so you don't have a large enough sample size for the kinds of, uns of, of uncertainty that we're, we're talking about. So end of, end of day, what, what, I'm, if, what it boils down to is that these scoring systems are, are very, they, they, they vary wildly. So I, I talked to Tim Clifford, who's a middle school teacher um, for 26 years in, in New York City. He got a six out of 100 for his value added model score. The next year, he got a 96 <laughs> out of 100. Okay, right there, that's a sign. <laughs> it's yeah, and wrong. he didn't change the way he was teaching. <laughs> right. He has a theory about like the kinds of students in the first year's class, the kinds of students in the second year's class. But at, at the end of the day, these numbers are supposed to sort of tell you whether you're a good teacher or not. And they told him he was a shamefully bad teacher, and then they told him he was an exceptionally good teacher. Right. And he, in the meantime, was the same person. Um, so it's just not a good scoring system. And in spite of that, the, it, these scores are being used for high stakes decisions. Um, and they're just, and so I'm interv I interviewed Sarah Wasaki, who in Washington school, Washington DC area school was actually fired for her bad assessment um, with uh, 205 other teachers in the same year. Um, so you have, you have these statistically unsound algorithms and they're just wreaking havoc on these school systems. And the, the goal, remember, the goal was to get rid of bad teachers the actual result of it is probably been to get rid of good teachers. Good teachers, if they see this kind of, you know, paradigm that they're, they're, they're working in and living in, they get another job yeah. and they flee. Yeah. And that's what you've seen. You, you've seen uh, early retirement. You've seen um, people um, fleeing to the sub suburbs. The rich suburbs do not have this kind of uh, regiment. Um, so you're really losing good teachers instead of losing bad teachers. So it's failed on every level. And so it, it's what I call a weapon of math destruction. It qualifies. Um, it's important. It's secret. I didn't mention that nobody ever gets their scores explained to them um, and they can't appeal them. There's no accountability. So it's influential, it's secret, and it's destructive. We're going to wrap things up uh, with one of the most interview, interesting interviews. And I noticed, I think we pretty much did this chronologically, didn't we, Carson? So this would be the, one of the last interviews of the year, but I, I think one of my favorites. Um, a little known federal agency we all know about arpa right they they invented the internet the uh, uh, darpa the defense advanced Research's Pro research project agency but uh, and they're still around but they they're a little brother their baby brother uh, iarpa is really cool under the office of the director of national intelligence what iarpa does is the really blue sky stuff they call the high risk high reward research and they do it with the help of academics and scientists and people all over the country who really kind of volunteer. 
We talked to Jason Matheny, he's the director of IARPA, about their seedling program. Uh, it says there are a variety of opportunities to engage with IARPA, and a seedling is another option to receive funding for your ideas. These are shorter 9- to 12-month research efforts designed to take an idea from disbelief to doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and some of these are just really... Uh, what's interesting is, I would imagine, you know, if you, at first I think a lot of this is about big data and machine learning, but some of it's just very, you know, uh, how, a, how a meme becomes a uh, reality you know or a spectral holographic optical processing or you know a study of uh, smart devices uh, I guess all of this stuff is is of great import to national policy uh, it's just it's it's fascinating right. yeah I think the the national intelligence mission which is really about understanding events in the world and anticipating events in the world communicating uh, events uh, all of that requires such a broad range of disciplines uh, to be advanced. So we fund work in physics, in engineering, biology, uh, chemistry, sociology, psychology, political science. Some of the, the work, in fact, that we're probably best known for is uh, in human judgment and decision making. Uh, because when, when analysts make decisions about what's happening in the world, it really is coming down to a question of what kinds of biases and heuristics do human analysts use in understanding the world, and how do we improve those? Um, so we ran the world's largest forecasting tournament that involved around 40,000 people making judgments about um, um, uh, millions of judgments about global events, um, and tried to characterize what distinguishes the strong forecasters, the accurate forecasters, from those who are not quite as accurate. So doing fundamental work on cognitive psychology is something that turns out is incredibly important to national intelligence, but um, as are those other topics that you listed. For instance, holography is something um, uh, that's important for presenting information, but uh, there's also optical computing uh, that allows us to, um, uh, to leverage light uh, to perform um, information processing. Um, memes are, you know, concepts that are sort of spread throughout uh, society. It's really important to understand those. For example, um, how do we understand the spread of uh, extremist thought uh, in different kinds of social media? Um, how can we understand the spread of misinformation? Um, that's important in order to analyze um, uh, how uh, events may be affected by social media in other countries. Um, and then we do quite a lot of work in uh, understanding um, how uh, uh, diseases are, are changing over time, how uh, diseases evolve over time, um, because that affects not only our, our own population uh, that might be um, posted overseas, uh, but also affects uh, global health and global stability uh, in um, in ways that I think are, you know, dramatically illustrated uh, in the in the last few years with Ebola, chikungunya, and and Zika. Um, to give one example, we co-fund a, a project with Microsoft Research uh, to develop a new kind of mosquito trap uh, that allows us to much more quickly analyze uh, diseases that are spread by mosquito. Um, and now that trap is is being deployed uh, by Microsoft in, uh, in Florida and, and Texas for, for Zika um, control. Um, but it has much broader applications to public health around the world.